Welcome everyone. Today we're going to look at the learning theory of constructivism. This is Roland, and this is me, Dan. I hope you're ready to explore. First, let's look at some of the theorists of constructivism. There's Jean Piaget, nice looking guy, Lev Vygotsky, and John Dewey, who has a sweet mustache. So, constructivism isn't really one unified theory, but has many contributors. Uh, we would consider these three guys the most influential contributors to the theory. Constructivist concepts are based on the fundamental belief that knowledge does not exist in the exterior world. All knowledge is constructed in the mind of the learner. To construct new knowledge, learners must experience an activity either in its actual environment or in a simulated environment, real enough to allow their total immersion in the situation. What? Sorry, I missed something? Yeah, okay, that was boring. Maybe this will make more sense. So take a look at this cartoon kid here. He has experiences at home, at school, with his friends, family, and everything else in the world. All those experiences are constructed in his mind as new knowledge and new understandings. Constructivists also believe there's no knowledge in the outside world. Um, think about, for example, the subjects of math, literacy, music, and science. Constructivists don't believe that these concepts in themselves contain knowledge. It isn't until a person has real-world experiences and interactions with these concepts that they construct knowledge inside their minds. Now that makes sense. Let's begin by looking at the positive components of constructivism learning theory. When people explore and have experiences, the knowledge that they do construct is more meaningful and generally sticks with that person longer. Or, in other words, better retention of information. Constructivism is student-centered. They believe that students should be the ones learning, exploring and creating their knowledge, not a teacher standing in the front delivering information for students to memorize. And constructivism evokes collaboration because when learners work together, they can reach agreements and disagreements. Agreements generally become new knowledge to the learner. Now let's examine some negative aspects of constructivism. Since learning isn't created internally, there's a possibility that mistakes could be made and even agreed upon. You can see why it would be bad for students to construct 2 plus 2 equals 5 in their minds and agree upon it. Even though it's incorrect thinking, to them, it's truth. Since constructivism relies on the learner to create knowledge, someone who is disorganized could really struggle without specific goals, guidelines, and structures. If you're going to teach using a constructivist approach, you as a teacher have to be well prepared. If a teacher isn't prepared, students could easily walk away from a learning experience believing misconceptions as truth. One other big negative is that we do know actual knowledge exists. Like in the example before, 2 plus 2 does actually equal 4, uh, no matter what. Cognitivism is a belief that knowledge is objective, and in the case of 2 plus 2, this is correct. Thus, constructionist beliefs that knowledge is subjective would be incorrect. Let's look at some present-day instructional strategies that support the learning theory of constructivism. The two guys we're going to take a look at today are Brian Camborn and Robert Marzano. Let's start with Dr. Camborn and some of his conditions for learning. First, you'll see the idea of immersion, where students should be immersed in their content, or in other words, have experiences in every area of the content. Next, you have responsibility, which means learners should make their own decisions about what they learn, when, and how. Camborn even says that kids who aren't allowed to make decisions feel depowered. Use is the idea of allowing students to practice new learning in realistic situations, not artificial worksheets. Approximation emphasizes the importance of students making mistakes and being able to learn from those mistakes. And finally, Camborn emphasizes that students feel they are the quote, potential doer or performer, and by having these conditions in place, the learner will naturally be more engaged in the learning. Now let's jump over to Dr. Marzano. Identifying similarities and differences helps engage students in comparing and contrasting information to construct meaning. Homework and practice is similar to Camborn's use theory, 
and emphasizes the importance of individual practice. Non-linguistic representations or visual supports because students will construct knowledge in their minds based on what they see and the experiences in their environment. Cooperative learning, which is more in alignment with social constructivism, is a way for students to discuss and compare ideas. When the group reaches agreement, new knowledge is formed for the individual learners. Since constructionists believe we learn through experience, objectives should be set to give a general direction, not too specific and adaptive to the student's needs. Finally, creating hypotheses is a way to ensure students call on previous knowledge to build on what they're about to learn. This aligns very closely with psychological constructivism. Aw, snap! Seen this before? Well, guess what? You can find constructivist learning theories in the 21st century learning framework. Take a look here. Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. All these concepts are tied to constructivism. In each of these, you as a learner are forming new knowledge based on the experiences in your environment and your interactions with other people. And what about this? Common Core? Heard of it? Well, you better have since 45 out of 50 states have adopted them. Let's take a look at the standards for mathematical practice really quick. Let's pull some quotes out. Make sense of problems. Reason abstractly. Solve problems in everyday life. Construct arguments and critique others. Proficient students consider the available tools. What's happening? Students are making sense of their learning. Students are constructing. Students are reasoning. Students are solving real world problems and students are choosing their tools. All of these have ties to constructivism. Man, all this constructivism talk has, has really got me thinking. I, I had this assignment from some, some guy, I can't remember his name, but you know, basically he said I could turn it in however I wanted to and I needed to do the research myself and I've really learned a lot through all my experiences and I have had to collaborate with others and when we agreed upon uh, answers that like became new knowledge and I just man I just can't remember that guy's name hello and welcome to the 21st century in the near future all of your classrooms will have all of the technology that we have here on the enterprise Jim and myself would like to talk to you about the learning theory of constructivism and how it can be applied with technology in school. That is right, Spock. Playing and experimentation are powerful tools for development of the mind especially in children. The constructivism theory has led to additional discoveries saying that there are powerful gains made when children work together and collaborate. That sounds logical, by giving students technology to collaborate through a variety of methods, blogs, wikis, text messaging, or even video chats. They can be learning from other students in their school or even other students from across the country. So you are saying that by using certain forms of social media like Edmodo, tweeting, or Facebook it could actually help students with what they are learning in school by socializing and communicating. Interesting. Yes Spock that is how constructivism works. Learners are constructing their own knowledge by testing ideas and approaches based on prior knowledge and experience. They will then apply this knowledge with something they may have just learned from a friend or other source of media and form new knowledge or ideas based from this construct. That sounds logical, but it is still okay to be using traditional classroom tools like pencils, notebooks, and books in the classroom. But for learners to assemble and modify their ideas those tool work but technology tools might work better, precisely. So? By using computers, videos, and other technologies that the learners are used to. It engages them with the immediacy of what they are used to in their everyday lives and brings purpose to the content. That sounds logical, right again, my pointy-eared friend. It does not matter what technology is in the classroom, but how the equipment is used that will make the difference. Teachers need to think that technology is an integral component of the curriculum, a chameleon-like tool that can be used in any content. This would mean that everyday applications like word processing, spreadsheets and mathematical problem solving would become more powerful instruments for learning. Constructivism has given teachers the flexibility to individualize learning for each student. That is great. How has this been done? One example is by flipping the classroom. 
This is when the learner goes home and watches a video of a lesson that the instructor prepares. When school starts the next day the students collaborate all the information that they learn from the video. And then they work on the lesson in class. That sound fun. Why didn't Starfleet do this? That is a good question. Well if you would like to learn more about constructivism please check out the resources in the annotated bibliography. Thank you. Live long and prosper.